Strategy. Design. Marketing. UX. Digital. Development. This is Agencies That Build. This show is dedicated to leaders and teams that design and deploy in the digital world. My name is Jesse, and I'm a marketer and an agency owner. And I'm Varun. I'm not a marketer, but a coder and an agency partner. This show is sponsored by Together We Ship. On a mission to help agencies grow. All right, rock on. Here we are. Hello, my friend Varun. What is new? What's happening? Well, cold day, sun outside, still don't want to go out, waiting for winter to end. That's what is going on in my life. I'm done with winter now. I think I really want this to go over now. Um, I would say that makes two, if not like 100 million of us in the, the, in the uh, northeastern part of the United States where the two of us are located. So I'm happy to see all the melting. I will will be honest. Yeah. So yeah. are you ready for today's guest? Because I'm ready yeah. for today's guest. Let me tell you a little have. bit about her. Yes. So she has a, interestingly enough, she started off her career with a degree in journalism, photojournalism to be exact, with a design focus. And then she began her career at the Chicago Tribune. So I don't think we've had a journalist who started off yet as, as a guest. And then she had this drive to start her own company. She is the CEO of Iris Design Collaborative. Haley Stryker. Welcome to the podcast, Haley. Hey guys, thank you so much for having me. So is it cold and snowy in Chicago right now too? <laughs> it was It was actually like 40 degrees the other day. I was out there in like shorts. I was living my best life in 40 degrees. I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, not to talk about the weather at the beginning here, but is it, it's funny how your body adjusts with a different, you know, like 40 degrees right after summer would have been freezing and we'd all be in winter coats, but all right, let's exactly. dive in. So what, we'll start with the myth buster. What sort of, what kind of myth would you like to smash? What sort of misconception would you like to set the record straight on? What do you want to clear up and lighten us? Okay. So I think it was beneficial for me to learn this. So I want to share it with others. Um, the myth that I want to bust today is that the most technically skilled person may not be the best person to hire onto your team. And what I mean by that is like soft skills, um, being adaptable, being flexible, uh, eagerness to learn, things like that are actually just as valuable, if not more valuable, especially in the sort of UI UX design industry that I'm in. So it was something that I had kind of learned along the way that, you know, you can always, platforms are always changing, There's new design software and new things all the time, but the eagerness to learn the excitement and passion about it is really what um, has made for just like the most amazing team members that I could have ever asked for. So when you say best skilled person. So what are you looking for in terms of an alternative? Tell us a little bit more about your thoughts around that. And, you know, is it, is it a cultural fit? Is it growth? Is it seniority? You know, walk us through kind of your process and what's, how you, how you've learned that. Yeah. So um, as you said, starting from a um, journalism background, um, I, I was, good with the hard hitting questions, right? Like I knew how to interview and, and all that good stuff. So I was going and feeling like really confident. And I just quickly learned that like, there are so many industries, especially in tech that are evolving. Somebody um, who maybe has these certificates in all of these programs, you're like, wow, so impressive. You know, they're probably the best at this. Um, may like actually not be the best at it because somebody who either maybe learned it themselves and didn't get their certificate, but has a higher passion and is more flexible, might be a better fit. So I guess I learned by trial and error, but that was a little bit of the process that I at least went through that um, I wanted to share here for others that might be like feeling that same struggle because hiring is hard, finding great team members is hard. And as an agency owner, um, you know, your team members are just a huge part of what you do. 
I think this is so true, in especially in today's environment, when, as you said, hiring is not getting easier and finding the specialist is even more challenging and if not expensive, <laughs> you know. Um, so finding somebody who is more flexible and adaptable um, definitely you know, makes sense. But you, you said you also learned by experience by hit and trial. So t- can you share some stories like how, what happened? Like what, what made you, at what point did you come to this conclusion that, you know, I don't need the specialist. I'm, I don't know how, was that always the case or did you start hiring with some specialist and then you re- learned along the way that, you know, maybe I should be more flexible myself? Okay, so I'm so glad you asked this because this is this is a great story. So when I started the company, I was like, oh, we're going to be a full service design group. We're going to offer print design, graphic design, um, website design, app design. So I hired for these specific design disciplines thinking, okay, if these people have the technical ability in these different design areas, then you have a full course, full service design team. Um, I quickly realized that that was not going to work. And um, basically somebody with a design eye can do sort of both, like can be the website you know, designer, can be the app designer because a lot of the principles carry over to each other and people are excited to learn and move into those different areas. So it was at the beginning almost like a, um, uh, I guess like a barrier, a game of telephone, right? To like, oh, well, now you got to talk to the web designer. Now you got to talk to the print designer for like clients if they needed something. So I quickly realized that um, uh, allowing team members to learn and grow um, and finding team members who were excited about learning and growing in different disciplines and excited about sort of following UI UX trends and seeing where that sort of took us was a, a much better a business model and B kept everyone sane. Um, Probably I wonder. Some, oh, go ahead. Sorry, I, I I just was wondering in that situation, how do you position yourself in front of the client, though? Because from clients' perspective, they are hiring you because you are a specialist for certain skills and certain jobs. And when you have a team, you know, I, I don't know, like, how do you, how do you position yourself? I guess let's just keep it that way. Like, how do you communicate that message to the, to the client? Um, so there's a question for cur- currently as UI UX specialists or the previous where I had all those specialties and everyone was playing. No, no now going like in the current situation, like how you are set up now. Yeah, so um, so we position ourselves as specialists in um, UI UX, but specifically in tech, all sorts of tech. And there's emerging tech, like right now, I'm talking um, to a bunch of people in the femtech area. And when I had started, femtech wasn't even a thing. Um, you know, it didn't even exist that there were healthcare solutions for women online. It, there was barely telehealth maybe four or so years ago. So really positioning ourselves as um, leaders in new tech, new tech spheres, as well as, um, you know, the fact that we do holistic design. Like we really uh, look into the specific problem that, um, you know, the, that the company has. Did you find that when you're hiring when you made the shift in terms of your hiring model, bringing in people who may not be dedicated specialists into, you know, I don't, generalist isn't the right term, but like allowing them to like flex their design muscles in different kinds of mediums. Did it create, did it change your culture at all? Did you find your retention rates, you know, from an employee standpoint, did that have an impact? I'm like leading the witness a little bit. I'm assuming it did, but I'd love to hear a little bit about how you know, that affected your, your hiring and staffing? Yeah, it actually had a huge effect on hiring, staffing, and culture. Um, not leading at all, because that's what I was going to say anyway. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) um, but basically, uh, it allowed for, um, 
members to get on like working calls and teach each other and also offer as like a soundboard. A lot of UI UX is looking at the world around you. I mean, design is everywhere. Design is on our Alexas, you know, UI UX designs on our phones, our tablets, our computers. It's, we're constantly on screens, even our smart TVs, right? So um, just kind of being aware of all the stuff around you and, you know, sitting in a working call with a designer and saying, oh, you know how Disney Plus has that carousel at the top. It's really usable and really cool, you know, sort of taking inspiration from different things and having that type of conversation really fostered a lot of uh, learning among the team and teaching each other and just it's it's a team sport, really. So if everyone is their own specializations, they're kind of in their own silos, opposed to just learning from each other and, and growing, which is, I think we originally had the name, you know, collaborative in our company name, but it really did become like the truest form of our company. It, it truly is us working together. It's us working together with the client and just like close communication, especially you know, in this era where we're all working completely remote, you have to be so communicative with everyone. And you guys have been fully remote the entire time, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Yeah. Um, my assistant manager likes to say that we were remote before it was cool. Um, <laughs> True. <laughs> <laughs> because everybody would ask like, oh, when are you going to get an office or, you know, when are you going to rent a space? Are you going to do it in Chicago? Or, you know, because I always had re remote help and, and it was almost like the business wasn't legit in a lot of people's eyes until I had a space. And I always said, I was like, I don't, I don't need or want a space. I like working from home. I like taking walks and that sort of fosters my creative environment um, that I can build my own environment and shift it as needed. So it's kind of funny the way the mindset is shifted because I don't get that question anymore from anyone. How do you guys, you know, with that collaboration that you mentioned earlier, I think this is a conversation we've had a lot of agency owners and how do you, how do you facilitate that collaboration? I'm not going to say foster because I think that one's cheesy, but it's like, I'm looking for specifics, tools that you guys have used, techniques that you've used. How have you really cultivated that collaborative environment? Because I think that's something that I know companies have figured out and, or agencies have figured out, but we're always looking for new and interesting ways because it keeps us, it keeps us young. I'll say it. It keeps us all young in terms of how we you know, think creatively. Yeah. So um, it's funny because the post pandemic tools that we have accessible to us now are very different from pre pandemic. There's a lot of companies that have added a lot of things. Um, the best example I can think of, of that is like, we used to just screen share to show each other something. And now in the design world, you have Figma where, you know, you can sit and actually watch each other's mouses similar to like any Google doc or presentation, but you also have, which they just came out with, um, and there are other com competitors and um, things like that, but they just came out with Big Jam, which is basically like a virtual whiteboard um, where you can draw, put sticky notes as if you're standing next to someone, putting up sticky notes, like in a general UI UX design process. Um, and we love it. I mean, because you're typing on sticky notes too, sticky notes never get lost. You can always read people's handwriting. Like it, it all sort of works in that really awesome way. And the tools that people have built for remote agencies have just been amazing. Yeah, that, that's so cool. Like using latest tools, but how do you, I think I uh, continuing on that thought about building that environment, what are, I mean, in terms of establishing a culture and keeping the team motivated, right? Since they're also working remote in their own creative environment, do you guys do anything differently to keep them more engaged other than just, you know, the, the work work, right? I mean, they are collaborating on tools, but outside work, how do they get that bonding uh, that you sometimes need between the team? Do you have any trick? tips and tricks for that? Yeah. Okay. So I have, I have two parts to this answer. Um, first part is work-wise. I'll do work and outside of work. Work-wise, 
Um, we're always encouraging working calls. So like we always, every morning, we talk about all the stuff that we're going to do that day. And if someone sounds like they're either bogged down or maybe they're hitting a bottleneck or they have like a creative block, some, you know, we kind of say, hey, do you want someone to jump on a working call with you and we can soundboard and kind of brainstorm together. So that's kind of how um, we bond over projects through work a bit, just one of the ways. And then outside of work, we actually do um, every Friday, we do <clears throat> a meeting in the morning and because Fridays are chill. So we're, you know, all in our hoodies and sweatpants and, and whatever fr Friday wear. And we talk about um, our highest points of the week and our lowest points of the week. And it can be anything like my high of the week was that I had an amazing pepperoni pizza yesterday and it was the absolute best. And uh, we just talk through those um, and we'll also play like virtual games. Uh, there's like virtual Pictionary and stuff like that. We try to do a new game every uh, week or so. Um, we used to do themed weeks too, It'd be like a Hawaiian week and everyone would come in in Hawaiian wear. Um, but sometimes on Fridays, that was like a little too, like, you know, Thursday night, you're trying to find some Hawaiian stuff in your closet type of thing. <laughs> so yeah. just like some fun stuff like that, that you would kind of do in a um, in-person environment at, at like, you know, a, I guess water cooler talk. Yeah. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit and ask you about how did you get into this business? Like you're, you were a journalist, how, you know, and, you know, in, interest in photography. So there was that artistry um, mine from the beginning. And then, you know, that makes sense to get into design world, but to start a business, it's not easy. I mean, you know, so how did that thought come in the first place? And how did you start? How did you grow? Um, where are you right now? And what's the plan? Yeah, so a lot of really great questions there. I'll um, start from the sort of beginning here. So um, from that photojournalism graphic design perspective, I had a great eye for things. And I also took with me a very um, important skill from journalism, which is critical thinking, which is really important in the UX world, as well as copywriting. UX copywriting is huge. A lot of people don't have the copy ready. So it's something that um, I have a strong skill in personally, and my team does as well because of the sort of mentorship that we give each other. Um, so really critically thinking like a journalist, like does, does this really need to go here? does this really make sense to a user? What you do in an article, you know, does, is this paragraph essential and you order the story in a way where the most important information is at the front. So those types of things, those types of, I guess, uh, soft skills that you learn from there was something that I was still passionate about and found that same passion in UI UX as well as the artistic um, perspective that you had said. And um, I'm, tr I'm trying to follow <laughs> your previous questions, but so that's, that's how I sort of started to get into that world. And I always wanted to go into digital because that was where the future was going. And I had every hope that maybe, you know, newspapers, as much as I love them, would get there. And, um, you know, when they weren't going there, I just, I was like, all right, time to abandon the ship. I really wanted, um, if you know, like Harry Potter, when you open up the newspaper, it's like the a video and like, you know, stuff like that in the newspaper, like hologram type of things. I really wanted that to be the future, but animated GIFs, animated memes. That's what we're going to see in the newspaper. Why not? Right. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> right. Like how the video <laughs> embedded in some way, I guess it's like that with tablets, but it, it would have been cool. So, um, but yeah, so then I guess uh, after that, then I, when I, I went out freelancing. I think UI UX just found me. It just, I was strongest in that skill set and I loved it so much. And then I sort of uh, built a team around it so that we could just do more and just take on some really cool apps and uh, clients. Yeah. And it's so cool that you made your own niche, right? Even in the tech startup space, like, you know, focusing only on the, uh, you said fem tech, uh, femtech, is that the term you used? Yeah, so like, um, I think the femtech and uh, health tech has been really strong with us. We've also done um, fintech. There's all, all sorts of techs, right? right. <laughs> but um, health tech has been a huge one that we've been a part of for sure. 
Yeah, that's so awesome. Um, I think the so uh, right right now, how 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 many people you have? Like, what's the team strength? Yeah, so uh, seven, including myself. You talked about mentorship, like how you mentor each other. So can you talk about that? Like how, what do you do? Like, how do you mentor each other? Like, do you have some set process around it? Do you have, you know, some regular cadence of teaching and learning in the team going on? Like, how do you, how do you do it? Yeah. So I guess um, it depends on the team member too, uh, because everybody has like different strengths. Um for example, like UX copywriting is really strong with me and I'm strong with some others, but maybe not some others. I, you know, logo design is one of the things that's not as strong with me, but some others, you know, are stronger in it. So we kind of look at um, strengths and weaknesses. And it's almost like you work on the weakness till it becomes your strength, right? So we try to push each other. And I guess the way we do that is just by projects. If we think that there's a project where it's like, you know, this will be a really great challenge for so-and-so let's, you know, let's do it. Let's um, team up on it. And this person will sort of learn from me as we go through the project together. Let me ask you, how you guys find clients? This is always a hot topic with agency owners. You know, we've, we've chatted with somebody recently that talked about the power of marketing over sales, the power of networking over both marketing and sales. You know, I'd love to hear a little bit about how you guys do it. At, um, and how are you finding clients? Are you RFP process? Are you networking into it? Is it a little combination? Can you, can you enlighten us a little bit there? Yeah, it is such a hot topic because it's so hard to do, right? Um, and as agency owners, you wear a lot of hats and you wear the accounting hat and the salesperson hat and you know the manager at hat. So um, it's a it's a mix of a lot of things. I think it's something that um, you know is still getting systemized. So we're sort of put, putting all sorts of outreach out there, I guess, doing social media um, and networking through like virtual events, virtual coffees. I know um, a really great um, source for me, at least, has been Facebook groups, especially um, as you'd mentioned before, in, in the femtech industry, because it is an emerging industry, it has sort of a close knit um, group of women founders who, you know, are starting up different apps and web platforms in that um, in that women's health tech sphere. So it's kind of great to when you um, have a couple of a really solid areas to sort of join where people are just talking about that kind of stuff is I guess the the basics of all of it but it is difficult to um, you know find that sweet spot of okay what when do I start kind of pitching them are they in what process are they in the, in that and I always like to approach sales in a really genuine way so if I honestly feel like hey you know um, this isn't the like we're not the best fit with for you i'm not going to try to sell you something um and that's i think the best uh, way to go about it yeah I, I totally agree with that i mean i recently learned that myself like you know having the power to say no to your sales lead the most qualified lead you're talking to like you really want to talk to them but have that strength to say no i don't think we are the right fit is a huge huge thing and can help you win bigger deals, you know? So uh, not everyone thinks like that. It's hard to let the client go walk out, you know? So, um, so hard. It's a, it's a cheer, so hard. Built up the trust though, in your reputation. I feel like that's something that we don't, we, you know, we talk a little bit about with other agency owners is the idea of, of, um, you know, with you, it's, you've niched down in such a smart way to, to become known within this, you know, femtech and this larger tech industry, but being able to say no and being authentic is the word that, you know, we've all overused recently, but it's this idea of when you do say no, you go, oh, wow, that's, there's something, you know, a little bit trustworthy. It feels good. And they'll refer other people who might be a better fit back to you too. There's something about 
you know, it goes back to identifying your ideal customer profile in some ways as a business owner and really digging into who is it, who, where do we want to go and how do we want to grow? How did, um, you know, we talked a little bit about it earlier. How did you guys identify that niche? Is it just an area of interest for you and, and a passion for you? I think that's something sometimes agency owners struggle with is smaller agencies anyways, is how do you, you know, you want to have your fingers in all the buckets because you don't want to say no, but you also, there's a fear in niching into a specific industry. Um, I guess, let me rephrase the question. How did you overcome some of that fear? I guess is, is a good way to ask that. Yeah, there's a total fear in saying no, right? Because you're a business owner and you know, maybe you have people on payroll and, you know, you, like, you know, a sale walks in the door and you feel like you're saying no to money or something, you know, along those lines. So it's definitely something that I think I, I had to overcome, but I realized that if I, if I thought about it this way, like everything that you say yes to, you're saying no to something else. So if I said yes to a project that maybe wasn't the best fit, that means that I'm saying no to maybe a project a week from now that is a really good fit because I no longer have the capacity for that project. And I could try to say yes to both. And I could try to, you know, like run myself super thin, which doesn't work either because you want to give like the best quality work to every like client that walks in the door. Um, I know another thing in sales to, I felt like promoting myself was weird. I felt awkward doing it, which I've heard a lot of business owners say too. Um, and that was a fear that I had to overcome. Like there's nothing awkward about just putting yourself out there and being like, hey, this is my business. This is what we do. You know, uh, you're not trying to sell someone something. You're trying to help someone if they have a problem. And if they don't have a problem, they're going to scroll right past your stuff. They're not going to, you know, I think there's a fear people will judge you like, oh, uh, look how much, you know, <laughs> I post me and my son all the time on my Facebook, you know, oh, look how much she posts of her and her son. And if people love you and support you, they're not saying that, you know, so um, overcoming that fear was also another big one for me. Um, I have a little, I think, execution question, like how the, your work related about the estimates like how do you guys so i understand you do mostly ui ux work so how does the discovery and estimations happen in your world like you know you are not doing a building you are not building or, or developing an app or you know uh, a back end it is mostly just a front end design work that you guys do so when somebody comes to you with with their business need right um how do you scope it like what are the best practices that you may have learned along the way where, you know, that has given you more accurate estimates in the beginning? That's actually a really great question because it's a, it's a hot topic. It is hard to give estimates and you want to give that roundabout estimate when you have someone on a call, you know, so that um, you have them right there. So how I do it is um, I basically identify what stage they're at. So at least for a lot of tech companies, you're in the startup stage and you're looking to make an MVP. I have kind of a quote for what an MVP is. And, um, you know, it's pretty standard across the board because you wanna make sure your MVP has the, co the core functions. And we really harp on like not throwing everything in the kitchen, in the kitchen sink in your MVP because you're never gonna get to market. Um, so we work on core functions in an MVP and I have like a price for that. And then somebody who maybe is iterating and, um, is in the middle place where like, they could hire UI UX product team in house, but they also could outsource and they're trying to figure out which one works best for them. For those people, I like to do an ongoing work, like hourly retainer, because the scope of work can change very rapidly because they're a little bit more of a mature company. They have a lot of different features. It may be more complex and quoting on a fixed price. Uh, you may be putting yourself like in a hole because then things are going to change and you're going to have a hard time scoping it out. Um, so those are the two that I kind of go by. And then I also um, offer an additional one for um, people who are maybe in the in-between of those. And 
Um, it's basically like a just discovery where we do an audit and we do um, competitor studies just to give them those aha moments and give them suggestions. So like a recent one um, that we did was like, uh, people know that something's wrong, right? Like something's wrong here, they can't put their finger on it. And then <laughs> we were like, yeah, the price, the price on this is red, it's the color red. So it looks like an error. And they were like, oh my God, that was, that was so simple, but it kind of took that expert eye to point out to us and then we can make that quick change. So um, that's another really valuable thing that a lot of people um, enjoy and start out with. And then maybe they decide whether they want to continue on going work with us. Do you believe in value pricing or hourly pricing? How do you approach your pricing? It's so hard, right? Because um, I believe in value pricing, but it's hard to nail down scope, at least in the design industry. Um, yeah. so it's a balance. If, if the scope is seeming like it's going to take more work to nail down, then you're really like chipping away at that value price just to nail down the scope. And it might not even be worth at that point. So, um, I think it's sort of play by ear in, in that sort of sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's tough. I mean, we, we hear this debate all the time, like, you know, agencies, some just do hourly rates and some do value pricing, you know, how much does this work um, worth to you as a client? Um, but then it, how would you justify, like, you know, it's hundred hour, hundred hour job for which you are charging me something, which is like, $500 per hour rate, but that is what is worth to you, then yeah, that's what I will, I'll charge, right? So um, yeah. it's, it's tough sometimes and finding the right balance would be, you know, I mean, I, I was not able to do it. I, I'm still not able to do it. So I wonder how people do it. So I always it, question this, like, you know, how you, how you approach it, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's like, I think the, the way that I have found you to be helpful is like, the more you can systemize your own processes, at least in my world, like, um, you know, a login screen is a login screen. There's not like much to change in that arena, right? So there's like a couple of things you can kind of do to maybe cut down the um, labor that may help you, uh, if you have a fixed price, um, be able to you know, do that value pricing without stretching yourself too far, even if the client adds a bit of scope. Um, but I know contracts are another like sort of uh, way to be able to do that and like limiting rounds of revisions, at least in the design agency world um, that I've heard of and tried for a little bit, but it became like, okay, then we need to add two more revisions. How much is that? And then two more revisions. And again, you're just spending more time scoping out right all the changes to the revisions <laughs> right yeah um it's an interesting oh, i have commentary there then i'll let you go Varun. you know it's an it coming from multiple different types of agencies and companies and stuff like that there is an interesting challenge with that with the pricing of the contract versus the hourly component of it and um, I'll just add the best way that I figured out how to manage that is know how long a project takes with some of the standard. And then mm -hmm. there's the uh, the uh, upcharge is the nice way to say that for when they want to add on things, they pay a little bit of extra on top of it to kind of manage those rounds of reviews. There have been other, as agency people know, there's other friendly names for that type of charge. But um, I won't say them here, but it uh, that has always amused me when that happens. It's like, do we put that one on? Like, how do we tell this client we're done without being like, we're done? So, um, yeah. Right. All right. <laughs> the, uh, the PETA charge, we'll call it that, P-I-T-A. You can Google that one and look it up at a later date for those of you listening. So. Um, anyways, just thought it was an interesting, interesting thing to add in there. Varun, you had a question. <laughs> yeah. So I want to go back to, I think, um, the soft skills that you talked about earlier, like, you know, having that, so you built a culture around being flexible, adaptable, and, you know, that fire to learn and, adapt, and, and, and grow along the way. Right. Um, how do you, so 
do have you formalized that as a process in the team where you know how do you make sure that they're learning how do you encourage them to learn what do they what do you do so that they are not just uh you know uh, where they are not learning where they are not moving forward how how do you like what do you do yeah so we have a process for um because we have um project managers and then underneath them are ui ux designers so when a um, new team member comes on board we kind of have first of all obviously an onboarding process and then um you know they do the onboarding process with one team member that way they have like one point of contact to find things if they need something um without having to sort of go in a merry-go-round and figure out which team member they need to find and then um you know once that team member who trained them feels um you know that they're in a good place uh which is normally i don't know a week or so <laughs> we have a lot of processes so it doesn't take long you just have to get used to the workspace um then that person starts starts talking to other project managers and project managers then have um routine check-ins whether that's just like a quick slack message about the person whether that's like a 15 minute meeting whatever it may be to kind of say hey this is a couple of the things that this person can improve on um how can we like foster that improvement um you know and this is what we've done so far to foster the improvement so that's that's pretty much it i i think that feedback and i know at least me as a designer like uh feedback at the time that it happens is really important for team members like if you wait a month or two to say hey yeah you know uh you've been having an issue with spacing or something like and then you try to pull up examples maybe you can't even remember because it it's been a couple months so i think a lot of people are afraid sometimes to address the person but having that honest feedback is the only way that people grow so i think too um you know team members and that soft skill we're also kind of looking for its openness to that constructive feedback. You know, it's part of willingness to grow is being open to hearing both positive and negative, right? Because you, you know, you want to make sure you're also saying, hey, you're doing awesome, you're killing it on this part, <laughs> but this part might need a little bit of work. Um, so just making sure you have that really good balance of feedback, and that's a really great way to help people grow. On that same vein, I'm going to ask you and put you on the spot here for a question. You know, Go ahead. in terms of growing, what was one of the biggest mistakes that you've made in running your agency that you can think of? And what'd you okay. learn from it? Let's, let's spin this. So it's a positive. <laughs> I don't have to think other than the, um, <laughs> the original, like trying to hire a bunch of specializations, which, um, I think was definitely something that I learned very quickly on. Um, a, a mistake. Well, it's a hard thing to kind of think through, you know, we've all, there's always the traditional ones of, you know, not charging enough or charging too much or not cutting off a project too soon or too early. You know, I think those are, are there, um, you know, we talked a little bit about hiring. Are there, was there maybe somebody that you, without naming name, names, but like, you didn't ask enough questions in your hiring process, potentially in bringing somebody in or didn't give feedback soon enough. Or, you know, I, I, uh, I know at various organizations I've worked at, you know, bringing in that Ryan hire can be so disruptive and not getting rid of them early enough can be equally as disruptive in some cases too. It's like, it's not the right fit. Just cut, let's go. And yeah. or, or not having not having your client sign a contract before starting their work. I did that mistake. <laughs> that's, that's a big one right there. I think, okay, my mistake is, I, it might be a little untraditional, but I think my mistake, the biggest thing I've learned is that um, setting realistic goals for myself and your team learns from you as a leader. And so and and that like follows through with all of your clients too like it all trickles down so i think one thing i really um learned from was i would be so hard on myself like oh you know i wanted to be here in my business in a couple of months and it's taking longer right so i think a lot of business owners maybe feel that like um i don't know that sense of failure but you're not looking at like oh but i in a couple of months i actually did move forward in a big way 
um, that I'm not considering. So I think that um, is sort of a big mistake I made because it trickled down into a lot of things. It trickled down into um, maybe pr uh, unrelated pressure to try to get something done quicker than really needed. Like, you know, oh, you know, you're trying to get it done in two days, but really if you take a week to do it, it'll be much better and, you know, you'll, it'll have more thought um, and time behind it than if you're really stressing and being hard on yourself to try to get it done in that short time frame. So changing that mindset on my own and then sort of communicating that among my team actually made for such a more seamless process because then that was communicated to the clients too. Like instead of, oh, I'll get it to you in two days, it became, oh yeah, in next week's meeting, these are the things we're gonna have. And it just became like, just, I didn't realize how it was <laughs> affecting everything else, but it's funny when you're a business owner, the things uh, you lead by example. And a lot of people follow in line with whatever you're doing because they they take that as the standard or the expectation in the company. Certainly, that's a, I think that's not, it's like a business thing in general, to be perfectly honest with you, not just the agency folks on any sort of leadership or mentorship positioning. So, but that was great. I have, I have one final question for you. So what is exciting you about the future? What are you looking forward yeah. to? Um, so I know we talked a lot about um, design is kind of everywhere. It's in your phones, your tablets, desktop and screens. Um, I think the exciting thing in the design world about the future is uh, the fact that we're moving out of the iPhone era and into wearables and into um, VR and the sort of new world of the things that we're seeing. I think it's really exciting. Like, like I said, the Harry Potter, like a uh, meme gift thing, we're moving into like the next phase of whatever um, our consumption of information looks like. And, um, you know, maybe that's VR, maybe that's smart glasses, maybe that's like a smartwatch that pulls up a hologram, but whatever that interface is, I think I'm really excited um, to just be a part of that sort of fluid industry. It'd be crazy if like Alexa had a hologram head that popped out of the top of her when you ask her, or like, what does Google actually look like? Hey, you know, so that's, uh, I hadn't thought right. about that, but creepy floating heads in everybody's homes that you can chat with. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. My husband like hates Alexa because he's like, she's always listening, but I'm like, she's so cool, but she's so great. <laughs> she is a, uh, it's an interesting, it's, it's weird to think back 20 years that that didn't exist. So, or 30 years maybe, but well, this was, this was a great chat. Thank you so much for sharing your story and a little bit about what you do and how you guys do it over there. So for those folks listening where they can find you is there's quite a few places. So I'm going to list them out. You're on the LinkedIn, you're on the Facebook, Iris Design Collab, um, Instagram, uh, all of those are linked off the bottom of your website. I want to call out your group specifically on Facebook, which is called Iris Design Community, Grow Your Business with Digital Designs for folks looking for them. And your website is irisdesigncollaborative.com. So thank you so much, Haley. Uh, that's it, everyone. If you learned something today or laughed, please sell please tell somebody about the podcast. See you next time. Thanks for listening. Find our other episodes on agencies that build.com. Plus we're listed anywhere you find your favorite podcast.